This is Joseph Coco. I am here in Ann Arbor uh, the day after a 2 calf on behalf of Becca Hilburn's Art Process blog. We are being joined by Ann, if you could say hello. And Becca is also going to be talking with Hi. Anne this evening. Um, it's great that she can be out from behind the table because the uh, mm -hmm. convention is actually over. Um, so I know you had some questions uh, uh, toward to Anne regarding the uh, convention. Do you want to start with that? Oh, um, yeah, I definitely do. So the majority of my viewers are, um, oh, some of them are comics kids. A lot of them are self-taught comics kids, so they don't have... They, this is their art school. They're teaching themselves, which I have so much respect for. Um, and they're kind of figuring it out on their own. And for many of them, especially in the South, your options for comic cons are anime cons, and that's not a comic con at all. So um, A2CAF was this weekend, and it was fantastic. It was so exciting. I've never, I've done many shows. I've done MoCA, I've done SPX, I've done Nokus Fest in New Orleans. I've done lots of shows, but I've never gotten, as a children's artist, I've never gotten to do a show for kids and teens, and that that's what A2CAF is for, and it's so refreshing. So um, could you tell us a little bit about your inspiration behind the show and why you guys opted to do a show for kids and teens? Yeah, so it started about eight years ago. So this is our eighth uh, conference. It used to be called Kids Read Comics. Right, right. Um, it started because there were so many comics, especially coming out in the, of the 90s, mm -hmm. where they weren't really suitable for kids. Mm -hmm. That's that's the environment I grew up in, so yeah. I, I remember that. And of, was it 2006? I want to say it was when Raina Telgemeier's Babysitter's Club yeah. Was, yeah. were picked up by Scholastic mm -hmm. and started coming out. There, you knew then that publishers had their eye on comics and saw a market for it, but there were still people who didn't realize that there were these great comics starting to emerge for kids and teens, and often people would, would still think that they were too violent, mm -hmm. they were all superheroes, they didn't have anything of substance to teach kids, and we wanted to prove people wrong and to educate people as to the wide range of comics that were available for kids and teens. And also coming from a library background, we were already doing a lot of comics programming. Um, so, Which is fantastic, yeah, by the way. Yeah. It started, I think, a lot with manga clubs and anime clubs where yeah. the kids were more consumers of content yeah, yeah. and then as you get groups of kids together mm -hmm. who are consumers of content you realize that they're also inspired to create the mm -hmm. content and the that was definitely what happened with me i didn't i wasn't in comics at all i did not care at all because growing up in the 90s all that was out for me was archie which didn't do it for me and superhero stuff which i'd watch on tv but the comics were so different and i couldn't keep up so when manga came over it was it was rama one half and in Yasha. that's what brought me in so i i was part of that generation i remember that and that i had been a writer before then and this was like this is so perfect this combination of images and words to tell a heartfelt story instead of just an action story so yeah i definitely <laughs> <laughs> can identify with that group of the, those groups of kids. That's fantastic. And the fact that you guys provided that kind of stuff for them because the environment I grew up in was absolutely not. It's garbage. It's trash. It, some of them thought it was even pornographic. Like, some of them thought all of it was pornographic. We weren't allowed to have an anime club or a manga club or a comic club at home, though, when oh, I was wow. a kid. Yeah, it was oh. Yeah, it was, it was hard. Um, so I'm so excited that you guys recognized that they wanted this and you gave them that because that's so perceptive. There's so many libraries that are even now not really on the ball with that kind of programming or recognizing that that yeah. desire there are a lot of parents who will still see comics as not being real books oh yeah my yeah. mom is one of them she's a kid she was a kids literacy teacher when i was doing my thesis at scad in children's comics oh, and wow. she was like i can't believe why don't you just do children's books why are you doing comics comics i mean really what's that about so there's definitely in fact in the deep south there is still a very strong sentiment that comics are, are garbage reading for kids which breaks my heart it is really sad because it's <laughs> visual literacy is such an important concept for everyone mm -hmm. and at an early age the earlier you can be exposed to it of mm -hmm. course picture books and things will take some of that but it's not sequential you're not right. getting to see all of the different the, the language of comics really speaks to a need that people have for their visual literacy right, skills. Right, right. It really supports um, 
uh, providing word picture examples, just as like the very basis, but it also supports the idea of a passage of time and teaching kids to, to think critically about what they're reading and to make conclusions about what they're reading in a way that picture books don't necessarily do. So, and how much is a two calf targeted at people who are resistant to comics as um, a, a literature form versus just uh, people who are already fans celebrating comics? So it's pretty much aimed at at everyone. So we want to make everyone love and accept comics. Right. So we don't really speak that much to the hey you people who don't think comics are of any substance or are a legitimate source of learning for children, we don't really target them. We just hope that by spreading a positive attitude and enthusiasm and the, the show has been building up and growing over the years. So sure. we hope that eventually we will cause enough of a spectacle that the people who are, there are people in the library who just come in to do their mm -hmm. regular mm -hmm. business and don't even realize that the show is going on. Right. We hope that enough of those people will be like, kind of curious, what's going on? That was there? a lot of the people who, who came by the table were, I didn't know this was happening, I'm just yeah. checking it out. Yeah. So even to get them interested enough to come and see what's at the tables and talk to the artists, I think that that's, slowly going to, to change some of their minds and bring some of them around. As somebody who took the opposite approach, I think your approach is the more sustainable approach because the more you try to argue with them, the more resistant they're going to be. But just by showing them people who are passionate about making quality stuff for kids and showing them beautiful comics and having these panels where the creators talk about their work, I think you can do such a better job at convincing them to give it a shot. Than by like demand, you know, That's having all of this research that doesn't mean anything about them. There are a lot of people who will say that yes, comics are good for reluctant readers and they're good for English as a second language, and that's fine. Uh, I used to argue against them and say yes, they are good for that, but but you're not looking at this too. And I try to not argue with them, and I'll just be like, yes, yes, they are. Come in and look at them and and learn other things about them by coming to find your examples for reluctant readers. And we've gotten people who were just looking at them as a tool for education yeah. to now, as adults, they are really into comics and they're reading everything that comes That's out. That's fantastic. Yeah, because I guess they saw the impact it had on these young people and, and it meant something to them as well. So they stuck yeah, with Then them. they realized too that, oh, there are literary stories being told yeah. by adults, there's memoirs, oh, yeah. there are so many other genres within comics that appeal to them and, and they can learn from as well. And you guys are really offering something that is so unique. I'm sure you guys know that, but like we've traveled around the country doing comic shows um, and you guys are really, a lot of the comic shows, especially the bigger ones, still put their focus on superhero stories or stories for adults. Um, whereas you guys are very much like this is an accessible all ages sort of medium. So it's like a really refreshing antidote to like the grim, dark, always cool, often PG-13 plus that many of the other shows offer that you can't really bring your kids to. I would say those shows are saturated with with that. More, like it's it's almost rare to find um, children's artists. Oh, yeah. In. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we've done Heroes Con and I love Heroes Con. It's a great show. But for me, as an emerging children's illustrator, children's comic artist, it's very, very difficult because the parents are there for themselves, whereas with a 2 calf they're there for their kids. So that's a totally different mindset that you you can work with. We've done some of the bigger shows too, the Jersey Night Table, and we found that they don't always plan well with putting, maybe it's changed a little because I haven't been to some shows in years, but we would end up often next to people who had strictly adult content. Yes, yes. We had adventure stories for kids. Yes. And there would be parents who would be covering their child's yes. eyes to not yes. see that. And they yes. would pass by our table and be like, but wait, we have dinosaurs mm -hmm. telling space adventure that's, stories. That happened to me <laughs> at SPS birds. and MOCA. Yeah, it, and, yeah. And once once the parent has decided that this is inappropriate for their kids, they've put the shields on themselves too. So you're punished for being next to this person yeah. who has content that is inappropriate to you. Um, 
I didn't get, I did walk around some, I didn't get to walk around as much as I would have liked. Um, but something else I've noticed with other shows is you'll have people who claim their stuff is all ages, but it's really not at all. I've been next to people like that, and that makes it difficult when your stuff is very much kid-oriented. Yes, anyone can enjoy this, but it is very much made for kids. Um, how does um, A2CAF, how do you guys deal with that kind of stuff? So I assume y'all do a lot of screening. Y'all are both very careful people who are passionate about, about this. Yeah, so the... A2 Cap team is actually made up of the KRC organization, and the event is juried, so they carefully review everything that's submitted. And we do allow in some content that's not all ages, but, right, right. but the people who have that content in addition to their all ages content, we make a point of saying it's fine if you have it, we don't want it in your face on the table. Mm -hmm. And if somebody, we want it back from your table, mm -hmm. and we want you to interact with the people. So if somebody is about to pick that up, if it's a five-year-old, intervene and have a good conversation and don't make it a negative interaction, but also have it available for the older crowd who is there because that might be their invite to comments. Right, and I, honestly, I was noticing that with um, some of the ladies around me in, in a positive way that they had um, they had stuff that attracted the teens and young 20s, something your women who wouldn't necessarily be into comics if it weren't for women like that kind of trailblazing the way. And then you have people like Carrie Peach, whose stuff is, is so cool, but it's so accessible. You know, like I would let my kid read it, but I read it too, you know? So that's like such a perfect medium ground there. Or, or Lucy Bellwood with her beautiful autobio stuff. Like if you have a kid who's into that, by all means, it's appropriate, but you would enjoy it too. Exactly. And that's definitely important to have. And there aren't enough shows that recognize how great those things are. So, Anne, I wanted to ask you, what was the process? You mentioned uh, you, the show is juried. What's the process for uh, curating the show? Uh, the KRC organization, you said, um, uh, yes. makes decisions about what artists are going to be getting in? That's great. So there is a team of, I think there's five people on the team who are looking over the application. So there's an application process, and once those are received, we want um, submissions that include the content that you would be selling. So uh, we do allow kids in the show too. So one thing I saw that. that is necessary, the only criteria we have for children is they have to have a comic. They have yeah. to have made a comic of some sort in some form and we will let them into the show once they've proved that they have something to sell at the show. Uh, but for the, the other content, we are looking for people who have created comics, who have something to sell, but we also want people who are good at programming, have experience with programming, be it doing a demo or giving a talk. Um, we try to avoid panel discussions at mm -hmm. shows like this because sure, young people don't want yeah, to just sit there for 30 minutes. Sit through and just listen to grown ups talk about how great comics are. They, they want you to show them how great comics are. Yeah. And especially since it's a visual media, right. it would be kind of boring to just have somebody like, comics are so great. And, but anyway, they are great. They get so fired up, they need somewhere to put that energy right away or it gets kind exactly. of lost. Exactly. So we are always looking for people who want to contribute something more to the show. And it doesn't even have to be programming that you do outside of just being at your table and interacting. Uh, if you come to the show and are too shy to interact with people and are just kind of like down in your sketchbook the whole time, we might be less likely to invite you back next time because we want to make sure that everyone feels welcome and is engaging with the people who are there. So. Right, right, because um, as comic creators, we're the ambassadors for the medium. There's many people who've gotten turned off to a comic because they had a bad interaction with one of the creators. Yeah. So yeah. it's so important. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. There's a few comics I used to like, and then I met the creators, and I was like, hmm. Oh. <laughs> but the opposite is true no, most sure of the time as well. Comics that I wasn't sure. Like, I read it, and I was like, I don't know. And then I met the person who did it, and I fell in love with the package. It was like, yeah, they're enthusiasm for so what they're doing. Just yeah. Sells you on what they're doing. So. I believe in them, so I believe in their work. So I can definitely understand why having people who are passionate about what they do is important. Exactly. And so we just want you to be on board with the mission of the show, the mission of the Kids Read Comics organization. Also, it's held in a public library. 
Uh, public Library serves everyone. We want right. to be welcoming to everyone, so we don't want it to feel like, oh, you're not part of the Cool Kids Club, you can't come and participate, because that's yeah. totally not the case. Everybody is part of the Cool Kids Club, and they should come and just love comics. Okay. And we also wanted to ask you uh, how someone in their own towns might want to get something like A2CAF started. Uh, obviously, it's a big undertaking, um, and uh, Kids Read Comics and later A2CAF has uh, a few people sponsoring it as well, right? As well as many volunteers. Yeah. So where would where would you recommend someone start if they want to begin building up to something like A2CAF in their in their retrospective town? For that, respective that's town? a great question. Uh, we are very lucky here that the Ann Arbor District Library is a very well-funded, large and enough institution that they can support something on scale that we're doing. Uh, we started out really small though. And it just, all you need is the desire to want to do this, and then you need to connect the right people. And that's where the problem usually is, because sure. you'll have a venue or an organization that would be perfect for it, and then you've got the people who want to do it, but you need to bridge those people somehow. So it's connecting with the right person who can put all the pieces together. So you mentioned that you've been to Heroes Con. Yes. I mean, if it hadn't been for Heroes Con, this would never exist because we went there, I think it was in 2006, and that's where Jersey, my husband, met Dan Mishkin for the first time. Jersey was a huge fan of Dan's work and went to talk to him to say, I love your work, I grew up reading it, I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> and that turned into, oh, I'm from Michigan. I'm also from Michigan, and it turns out that Dan doesn't live far from here. So we were able to then continue discussions with Dan, and he said, you know what I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted to create a convention, a comics convention for kids. And that conversation that they had planted the seed, and then the first year it was at the Chelsea District Library, which is a small library just uh, west of Ann Arbor. And so they got a librarian from Chelsea on board with their plan. Um, administration at the library was on board with their plan. And then um, Danny Katie Merritt from Green Brain Comics, so a comic shop also. So you just need to find the right people with the right know-how and the right access to a venue, the right access to a little bit of funding. So somebody who is extremely enthusiastic and energetic and so you just need to find basically Superman or Wonder yeah. Woman to <laughs> yeah. help put all the pieces together. So if you don't want to do something that large, you can start small. So the Ann Arbor District Library started with a manga contest. So after the anime clubs and manga clubs and the kids wanted to actually do stuff, they brought in a few cartoonists, local cartoonists to judge a manga contest. And just small events like that built up over time. And then they started a weekly, I think it was a weekly comics class. I think it was called Graphic Novel Academy. And that ran in the summer and more and more kids would come to that. And so we started just doing comics programming and bringing the kids in to do hands-on things. Mm -hmm. And then that got the kids actually making the books. Yeah, and then so they have something to sell. Have something they want to sell. To. Yeah. So if you are just a librarian or someone who wants to put this on yourself, just start a manga club or a workshop for kids to do it and then just have a really small scale kids comic con. That's about where we are with the National Library. We finally took three years, three years of writing, three years of nagging. We finally found a teen librarian who is into it and wants to do it. Um, and so now we're finally getting that ball, ball rolling. So I'm hoping in like the next three years, maybe we can have like a mini comic con for the kids to sell their stuff. But it's in Nashville and I think maybe the South in general, that's what I'm familiar with. It can be very difficult to get teens to put themselves out there like that because they're so afraid of their peers making fun of them if they, if they fail. So it's, um, that's going to be an interesting challenge is to try to reprogram them into seeing it not as a failure, but as a step towards the bigger goal. Yeah, you almost have to start with younger kids. Who yeah, don't yeah. Have they don't the have that critic yet. And they <laughs> right. don't have, yeah, but that's tough. And I, I don't work as much with teens, so I haven't 
I don't have a good solution to that problem <laughs> other than I was a teen if and I'm going to put I'll myself let you out know. there. But yeah, if I ever yeah. can learn the secret to that. Because usually I work fantastic. with um, like middle school is about the level I really like working with. Um, so I'm hoping we're going to skew kind of young on this because they are still, there's something so wonderful about younger kids and how they feel about their drawings, how they feel about their art. They think they are the best. And I will have, I will take any 12 year old telling them they can draw better than me any day because I want them to feel like that forever. I want them to feel empowered as opposed to the 14 year old who won't even let me look at their sketchbook because they're afraid I'm going to say something to them because someone else kicked them at some point in time. It's so much easier to guide the, the unspoiled pride than it is to try to nurture somebody back into feeling confident about their work. Yeah, if you can reach them when they're young and keep encouraging mm -hmm. them, then mm -hmm. you'll watch them grow and when they're a teen, they'll still be comfortable. Hopefully. That, so. Yeah, hopefully so. So would you recommend if someone was trying to start a uh, convention uh, similar to a TCAF in their, in their local town to target um, a younger audience or a, a mid-grade audience? That is a great question, and it probably is going to depend on the community and the people that you can get connected. Because if you have the right person who is able to speak to teens, because there's some people who are like they're like a teen whisperer. Yeah, if can you get even the surliest teenager to open up. Okay, so just play towards your strengths, basically. Yeah, play towards okay. your strengths and know your audience. So the same as like, anything you're trying to do mm -hmm. in a community, just. Yeah. Gauge the interest levels based on what you know, and you'll learn right. from your mistakes and fail. And and would you say would you say that's similar with funding? Like, um, is a two cap mostly funded by nonprofit organizations or comic shops or some combination? So or also government. We are so lucky that most of it is funded by the library. So the library was already putting on programming and events, and so it fit within their mission. So finding. A great partner like that is always, if you can, if you're lucky enough to do that, it's yeah. the best way to go. Um, we started out without funding, so Kids Read Comics as an organization, we filed to be a nonprofit, so we are a nonprofit in our state, and we can accept donations. So some people over the years, different businesses in the towns where we're having the event. Um, different businesses that are associated. So Green Brain Comics, where Dan and Katie Merritt are, that's their shop, they've been very generous in supporting. So if there's something that we've needed to fund, they will pitch in sometimes and sure. people take donations at, at the counter and on Free Comic Book Day and, and different things like that. So if you are able to find somebody, there are a lot of people who work for nonprofits or who are good at grant writing. Uh, if you can find a grant to fund it, I know that's a lot of work. So you still, again, are going to yeah. need somebody who has the time and dedication to do that. And sometimes grants can be tricky and yeah. you need somebody who understands the language. Um, so just talking to other groups, it doesn't even have to be another comic group, any group that's putting on public events they can help you with that sort of stuff. If you have the know-how to do the comics portion, you just have to keep bugging other people in the community right, right. have that other knowledge and get them even On board. to share their knowledge. Not even maybe even if they're not really into comics. Right, right. But just to to say like I need to know how funding works, I need to know how this works and they can help with that. Okay. So that that in that case, then you need to attend community events and talk to people so that you exactly. can meet those people. Yeah, find out what else is happening in the community. That also helps to get to know your audience because you'll see the successes and failures of other events and things that are happening mm -hmm. in your town and learn from those and maybe see where where else there might be a hole to be filled where there isn't programming for it. Right. And incorporate that in and maybe you can get another group that's that true. Yeah, on yeah, board yeah. and you can team up and make things happen. Okay. So speaking uh, to artists, would you have any recommendations to aspiring uh, children's artists, either children's books or uh, children's comics for trying to break into the industry, uh, either self-published or maybe even approaching editors? I don't know if you have much experience with that. So I personally don't have a lot of experience with that. Uh, most of what I know is from interacting with people who have been tabling at other mm -hmm. events who have been published or who are trying to self-publish mm -hmm. and get their books out there. Okay. And then I'm also a selector at the library, so I have right. some experience. You could definitely tell us about that. So 
a lot of libraries will purchase through large distributors right. because we get great discounts through them and it's really easy Diamond to... Diamond for Red is one, right? So the library doesn't work directly, at least my library doesn't work directly with Diamond. I don't know if any do. Some of the larger ones okay. might. Well, what what yeah. are some of the distributors? Because I know this, oh, is, so this is like what I want to learn about. And Taylor, I, Baker and Taylor. And Ingram okay. are right. two yeah. main ones that libraries deal with. And if your book is listed in there, that's how libraries are going to find it. Right. Um, and if you're not on there, your chances of being found are pretty low. Most likely, a, a lot of libraries, although it's changing, some people are buying through Amazon and other sources mm -hmm. as well, um, but typically it's set up so the finance department sets it up and all you do then is build the cart and Baker and Taylor and then finance just purchases and it's just this system that's been in place, that's how it works. Sure. It's smooth running, so right, it wants right. to change that. So, so step one, if you've got this children's property that you want to get into libraries is to make sure you're on Ingram's or Baker and Taylor or both, if that is allowed. I'm not yeah. sure if that's allowed. Yeah. Yeah. You need yeah. 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 So, yeah. So yeah, yeah. you can purchase. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And then beyond that, of the people who are into comics and are aware of them will find your book that way because they will have heard about you through their knowledge of comics. But for people who... So audience, having an audience would yeah. have an audience who's passionate enough about your work to mention it. That's and really that important, and that's hard to get. Get your books in front of the librarians who write for School Library Journal oh. and some of the other publications. How would you do that, though? So, there are, I should know off the top of my head. There are a lot of blogs, blogs. that claim that you can do yes. that so, and want it for free, but there's no, it's very difficult if you don't know anything about it, if you're a total babe in the woods like me, <laughs> it's very difficult to know which ones actually do have those connections and which ones are pretending that they do. I would like to have those connections, but no. <laughs> I mean, when you're paying for this out of your own pocket, you can't afford you can't send like comp copies right, to right, everybody. To everybody. You. Right. So there, if you go to ALA, which which I've done, done right. uh, then you will meet some of the people there who will. Bridget Alverson is one of them. Okay, yeah, and yeah, I'm familiar with she her. She blogs for, and I should know off the top of my head the name of the blog. She used to do a lot of manga blogging, yeah. which was, a, that was really important. That I think that really helped some libraries start their collections because they just didn't have a clue. And you yeah. can't blame them for not having a clue because there's so much of it. Oh, the no flying, no types? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, blog that's been that. recommended. And, um, oh shoot, Deb Alki is another one yeah. who does a lot of, that sort of outreach and writing. So if you can connect with a librarian who is putting themselves out there and has a lot of content on their blog, also if you go to the website for School Library Journal, you will be able to search through their comics lists okay, and yeah. be connected with the people who are writing for those. So okay. for, uh, for Library so, Journal, I know it's librarians who are reviewing and writing, and it usually says like where they work, and you can Contact, them, contact them, go to that library's website and contact them. So even if you're contacting someone, like cold calling them mm -hmm. to say, I have this book, I'd like you to, to take a look at it and review it. Um, it's better to do it through research and get it in front of somebody who you know is already into that right, rather right. than just walking into your Edge local library with a copy of the book. Right. Often people are really put off by that. Yeah, I've noticed so, that. No, I, no I, I went to I donate copies it. to the one I grew up in because I'm from there and the book's yeah. set there and uh, they looked at me like I handed them a dead skunk, which is so, so good. She didn't even flip through it. She's just like, all right. And to be fair, this library has never had a comics collection and it's always been staunchly comics or garbage and I hope that it changed over the years I guess it hadn't and it sat in special collections for two years which meant no one knew it was there and I had people request they would tell me I requested your book and they they claim they don't have it and I know you've donated three copies what's going on so yeah yeah so if you, if you so that show is, up with the book it often gets in front of the wrong person. Right, right. They often the don't know what to do with it, and so it will just get shuffled along, sometimes lost in the shuffle, sometimes it ends up at the wrong person's desk, and they're like, I, this has nothing to do with my collection, and right, it right. will go away forever. So if you do want to donate copies to specific libraries, maybe because that's your high school, or that's where you, the 
town you grew up or it's or set in that you're, town. You're at a show and you have a few extra copies. And a lot of, maybe a lot of the customers asked if your book was in the library for them to check out. How would you go about finding the right person to donate it to? So it's really going to depend on the library. Again, I'll always, I wish there was a, a great universal answer to this, but it's going to depend on how accessible the person is at the library. A lot of times the selector is someone who works behind the scenes and mm -hmm. they're not at a public service desk. Yeah. So I recommend just contacting, like using, if the library has a contact us form, writing a brief introduction and explain what it is, who you are, what it is you're doing, why you think it's important that the book belongs in their collection. Yeah. If you come in and just say, I live in your town and I wrote a book. Right. That's not giving somebody enough information, you're just giving them like five tasks to do. They have to right. figure out who okay. you are, what age group the book is for. Um, oh, so that's another great one. If you've written for a very specific age group, yeah, um, librarians and teachers, they need to know this information because that's how they put their collections right, together. Right. So if your book is for like fifth and sixth graders, if you can say that, mm -hmm and say what the, the subject is and like basically have an elevator pitch. Something that's short enough that they'll look at it. Include that, even if you include that with a copy that you are hand delivering. Even if you really insist on hand delivering a book to a library, like you'll probably lose the book. Like yeah. It will never be seen again. Right. But um, emailing them first with a brief intro, who you are, the age group, that will often be enough information where they're like, okay, this person, they mean business. Right. They're not making me do a chore other than connecting this person with the book. And you're more likely to get the book in front of the right person. Then. See, that's so, that's so important to know. And I don't, I mean, I, I have researched this multiple times over the years and I've never been able to find a concrete answer. And I've asked multiple people and I've never been able to find a concrete answer. So thank you so much because that's really important. You wouldn't know how much time I've wasted, how many books I've wasted, how much heartache I've gone through because I didn't know and I couldn't find out. And when I asked other, other non-self-published kids, children's art, they were like, well, well my, my publisher handles that, so I don't that, know. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Have you? And they're also the ones who are like, have you tried donating your books in person? So like, apparently that is yeah, not you, the way to go. Maybe like, one percent of the time you will connect with the right person right but the chances are that it's going to be somebody who doesn't deal with that collection when you you walk in off the street that's so good that's so good to know because i was feeling um really kind of meh about it how persistent should you be i get a lot of um and I, talking to other artists the non-response is like the default no just never hear from somebody again should you email them again like a month later so yeah if you don't hear back i would try again i wouldn't be doing it like every day no no of course once not a week. but right. yeah if if you haven't heard back it might just be that you've hit them in a really busy time yeah. of year or Went to sometimes spam. yeah it will go to spam or if it's a large institution sometimes contact us type forms if you weren't able to figure out the name of the person that you wanted to who is the selector for comics or for children's books it will just go into a big group yeah. and the people who should get it don't always get right, it. Right, right. So I recommend, yes, do send it along again and if be persistent but okay. not annoying. Right, right. And that's that's such a, a fine line to walk because uh, when you get that first non-response, it's, it's like, well, is it me? Should I, is this a hint? Usually, but there can be all Usually kinds of reasons behind people that. People are, are really busy and some things fall off the radar and often it's something like that that will fall off the radar because it's not immediate. So right. do be persistent. And it's probably the same case with um, proposing children's programming or teen programming is you need to do your research and figure out who exactly you need to talk to. Which, um, going, I'm not writing against the South, it's just where I'm from. Their library systems, especially in Louisiana, are often just not set up very well. They don't really have a good web presence, so it's very difficult to find out who you need to talk to. And even if you go and you ask in person, they often can't tell you who you need to talk to. So I guess you have to be persistent with that and just keep trying. So for my Southern friends, it is a worthy pursuit. <laughs> Please don't be discouraged. So, Anne, you'd mentioned that sometimes librarians might be put in charge of collections like a comic collection or a manga collection, and then they might not be that familiar with uh, the works either because uh, it just didn't appeal to them at the time, or maybe it wasn't even around uh, when, when they were growing up reading those sort of things. So if, um, if a, 
a self-publishing artist wants to try to get in front of those uh, particular librarians, uh, would you say that it's worth the $300 to $500 per uh, individual journal that it might cost to possibly get a good review from Publishers Weekly or School of Library Journals or uh, Book Life or those sort of things? Like, because uh, it's it's fair amount of money, and obviously, you know, you need a, a decent product to start with, and you can't speak to to every individual person. But what's what's your experience with that? What's your gut feeling if if the artist doesn't have an agent and they're self published? Do you think it's worth it for them to pursue uh, one of those avenues of um, uh, promotion? It's a great question, and I think it, again, it's probably going to be case by case. So, if you are confident in the book that you've published and you, this is your baby and you want it out in the world and you have the funding to to do that if even if you have to struggle a little bit to get that funding uh, the trade-off might be worth it because somebody who's not familiar with comics they're getting their information from those journals right. yeah. and if they see something with a good review in a journal they're much more likely to be oh this is this right. is a legit book. I should have this in my collection rather than if they read it on like John Smith's blog. And maybe John Smith is a 16 year old who reviews <laughs> comics and yeah, he loved it and he gave you a great review, but that doesn't mean as much as coming from Publishers Weekly right, right. or School Library Journal or if you are able to get a review in one of the publications that is in front of these people they're much more likely to see it because that content has been curated specifically right. for them. Right. And again, you're not giving them an additional task where they have to go and hunt because often people who are in charge of a collection like that without the interest, they are in charge of a lot of different areas of the collection that they don't know about and they're needing to do their own homework to, to educate themselves on what should be in that part of the collection. Sure. So any tools that can be given to them to help get them to your book. I highly recommend it if you are able to, to make the sacrifice to get that into there. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Anne, for the interview and helping organize A2CAF. We really enjoyed the con and encourage other artists to attend.